Yeah, so I'm going to read from Judges chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. And Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for history and history makers. I thank you for scripture that records these stories of heroes of faith, men and women, ordinary as they were, who you chose to use for your glory. I thank you for the story of Deborah, and I just submit my preparation to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you will take control of my words and speak to us as you desire to this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as you know, the Bible hero for today is Deborah. And before I begin to talk about her, I'm just going to give some backstory about where we're at right now in God's story. Um, so the Israelites have, under Joshua's leadership, uh, crossed the Jordan. They've entered the land that God has promised to give them as their inheritance. Um, they have witnessed God win battles for them, uh, hand over nations into their hands. Um, they've witnessed his power. Um, and they've also been allotted. The 12 tribes of Israel have been allotted their inheritance, but there are still nations and there are still enemies in that land who Joshua says to them, God will deliver them from. God will move, remove these nations from the land because God has promised that this land is their promised land and the land of their inheritance. Um, why God kept enemies in the land, why he didn't completely wipe the nations out, there's a clue of that in the word, but we won't get into that. Um, but yeah, so this, the, the backdrop is this, that they've crossed the Jordan, they're in the land, they've been allotted, there are still enemies around, and their only command is to be obedient to God. Joshua tells them that they need to be obedient to this God, they need to serve him with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, they must not bow down to any other God, they must not make alliances, marry, um, intermingle with the other nations um and this is their command and and of course he's like you if you're making this covenant you have to obey it because if you don't god will be angry he's a jealous god and his anger will be aroused and they're like of course we're going to be obedient like we've seen the power of god we've seen that he's been on our side we've seen that he's continuously delivered us so yes this is our commitment we are going to obey him and serve him alone so this is their uh, state right now and what happens is Joshua dies, a whole generation passes by. And this generation, of course, has known about God and they've, they've seen God's deliverance, etc. But a whole generation passes and a whole new generation comes. And this generation doesn't know the Lord. This generation does not know the mighty acts that God has done for them. And so while the enemies are still around, while the other nations are still there, this generation is bowing down to other gods, they're serving other gods, they're intermarrying, they're basically just going away from God's way. And this obviously upsets God. Um, they sin, God's anger is aroused. And in fact, he gives them into the hands of their enemies. Um, and in this time, of course, this, this happens and, and people, the Israelites are suffering now and they're really like under oppression. And so they cry out to God and in this time and in this season, God raises up judges. Uh, so he raises up people within Israel who can lead the people who know the law, who settle disputes, who lead people, who lead the nation back to God and back to his ways. So they get oppressed. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge. The judge saves them. The judge delivers them. The judge dies. And again, they fall into the same pattern where they sin, they do evil, they go to other gods etc. And so this is the story. And um, yeah, so now I'm coming to exactly where we're at right now. And I'm going to read verses, uh, verses six again, it says, 
in the days of Shamgar, Sanavanath, in the days of Jail, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. So this means that, you know, there was a general sense of like terror and fear and oppression. And, you know, people couldn't just go a straight way. They had to go on crooked ways to do things, etc. So that was the that was the spiritual atmosphere. That was the political atmosphere at the time. And now enters Deborah. So why was this the case? Why was this the atmosphere of the nation at the time? And we're going to read Deborah 4, or uh, Deborah, um, yeah, Deborah, Judges 4, which talks about Deborah's story. So Judges 4, verse 1 onwards. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So Ehud was another judge who was raised up, saved, he died, and again Israel sinned. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harosheth Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. So this is the reason. Sisera is leading the army. They're under this very oppressive king. And, you know, they're really oppressing the Israelites. And so this is the nature. This is the state, the atmosphere in the nation at the time. Now, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. This itself is a moment to pause and reflect. Um, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. Now, why was a woman leading Israel? Why is it God's design to have men lead? Why is it God's design to have men be the, um, the leaders of army, leaders of nation? That we can't question right now. But that was God's design, that men would lead the nation. But the state of the nation had got to such a point that there was, that Deborah, a woman, was leading this nation. And if you look at, uh, if you look back at verse 7 in Judges 5, it says, Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back. So they were not leading. They were not fighting. They were not, the men were just not, uh, they had, who knows why? Had they fallen into a place of complacency and comfort? Were they too afraid of the, of the Canaanite leaders? And were they too afraid of, the, of Sisera? We don't know why. But for whatever reason, they were not rising up to lead or to fight. So here is Deborah a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, who was leading Israel at the time. And it says that she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So she was a prophet. The Bible tells us that she was a prophet. So she was obviously hearing from God, speaking God's word. And people knew that that was who she was in the nation. And so then God rose her. No one else was willing. So God rose her to the point where she was holding court. She was settling disputes. She was a judge. She knew the law. She was just, she was a judicial judge for the nation. She knew the law and she could actually be there settling disputes for the Israelites. And so here she is, just a prophet. Nobody else was willing. God raised her up into this place of being a judge where she was settling disputes. And obviously, because she's in this place, she's hearing the complaints of people. She's hearing the oppression that they're going through. She's, she's in relationship with them. She's constantly hearing their stories. So she knows the state of the nation. And uh, because she's in that place, uh, she could sense what's on God's heart. And so this is what follows. She sends for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them out to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. So here is a woman. She knows the oppression that the people of the nation are going through. She is in that place of being a judge, being a prophet. So she hears God's instruction at the perfect time. And she sends for Barak and she gives him this instruction. She give, he, the instruction is so specific. He gives her exactly which tribes he needs to go to, the exact number of resources she needs, the exact point of entry. So the perfect strategy, he, she gives him everything, you know, and she says that the Lord will deliver his army into your hands. 
uh, it's like it's all just set up for him to for for victory and for him to kind of for finally for the land to be free from this oppression. And this is his response. He says, "If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go." And again, what this is telling is of the state and the nature and the situation that the men and the people of the nation were at at that time. Here, first of all, she's in this place of leadership. She's in. She's you know, con- she's giving an instruction. It's so clear, and yet there's this cowardice. There's this fear. There's an apprehension. In fact, there's a the attitude is almost like arrogance and disobedience. It's like, no, I won't go if you don't come with me. I'm not going to go. So it's like you know that complete uh, rejection of God's word. And yet she was like, she's like, this is her response. So she's like, certainly I will go with you. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So she's like, you know, if you're going to have this attitude, if you're, if this is going to be your response, you know, then I will come with you, but you will not get the glory. There will be no glory for you in it. The glory will go to a woman. And this is the word. She's just obviously the first option for god was to deliver sisera into the hands of bara so again kind of raising up a man in the nation etc but because he denies and because he says no i won't go if you don't go his second option then is god's second option then is to say okay i will deliver i will still bring you the victory but i will deliver sisera into the hands of a woman um and so basically what happens then is that she leads the army um bara calls from the two tribes of israel they lead the army they go she gives him the specific instruction at a specific point of time and then the entire army is defeated and finally you can read the story but sisera is actually delivered into the hands of a woman um and god's word through debra was fulfilled um you know a woman got the glory at the end of it it was yael who wasn't even on the scene so this this woman was not even on the scene and then but god's word was that sisera will be delivered into the hand of a woman and so out of nowhere she comes into the scene and she gets the glory um and so yeah and so this was obviously not god obviously not god's first choice but god stuck to his word and um he finally delivered sisera into the hands of a woman and then jabin king of kenan was so subdued uh, because sisera had not been leading his army anymore and finally he was defeated and peace reigned in the land of israel uh, for 40 years and of course debra because she was leading israel at the time she was the one who was leading them through this time of peace so from being a prophet and just being sincere in hearing god's word ministering god's word to his people because nobody else was willing she was raised up to the space of being a judge she was settling disputes she was in relationship with people she was hearing their issues and then of course god got her to the point where he was giving her that specific strategy to bring israel complete victory and even that even in that nobody else was willing so she stood up she stepped up she led them in battle and then finally she was raised up to a political position in the nation where she was leading this nation through its time of peace uh, for 40 years and so uh, she is one woman uh, and 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 the thing is that there's a, we don't know why but there's no other woman mentioned in the bible who is in this place of leadership obviously it's god's choice and god's desire to have men lead to have men uh lead armies um be judges etc cetera, etc cetera. and for some reason there was no one willing and ready at the time and so she stood up she was available she just allowed god to use her and one would think that at the time she may have felt inadequate she may have felt like i'm a woman or she may have felt that she was not good enough not strong enough not skilled enough to lead this this army right but then it's like the glory can only be god's because really it is in her weakness that his strength was made perfect like she was available she just chose to step into that place and then he used her and of course at the end he got glory uh, for it because yeah he was he won the victory he led sisera into the hands of a woman and um after debra we don't have any other stories in the bible of women who've led israel or women who've been judges 
uh, but there have been many in the recent years and I'm going to read uh, one story. It's about Catherine Kuhlman and what's written about her. It says, Catherine Kuhlman undoubtedly had one of the most influential ministries of the last century. She was a healing evangelist who witnessed extraordinary miracles and inspired many others to follow her footsteps. But Catherine said she was not God's first choice. She believed the Lord had called other people before her, but they had been unwilling to obey. She said, I believe God's first choice for this ministry was a man. His second choice too but no man was willing to pay the price. I was just naive enough to say, take nothing and use it. And he has been doing that ever since. Catherine Kuhlman believed she received her mighty anointing and calling, not because she was the best, but because she was obedient. And for those of you who don't know, I just recently found out she was Be uh, Benny Hinn's mentor, who has this super powerful healing ministry all over the world. and. Really like Deborah could have had so many fears of inadequacy, not being good enough, not being strong enough, not being skilled enough. It's not even, wasn't even her responsibility, actually. It was the responsibility of a man, but she chose to be available. She chose to just allow God to use her and God used her to bring victory for the nation and to deliver the nation from their enemies. And just the fact that we are here, just the fact that we've been willing to show up even to this very Sunday service um, just may it be a sign that we are just available and open and ready to be used by God. Um, and just may none of our inadequacies of not being good enough, not being smart enough, not knowing enough, not uh, having enough. May the story of Deborah just inspire each one of us that we just need to be in that place of availability um, and that God will use us for his glory. And so I just thank you, Lord. I thank you so much for this story. And I just want to read as we began. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. I pray, Lord, that each one of us will rise. Each one of us, Lord, will just be vessels ready, available to be used by you for your glory. In your name, Jesus. Amen.